Okay, welcome everyone uh, for joining us um, at um, the TFD uh, and NED Core Institution plus Freedom House virtual panel. Um, I am Keri Chen, um, the Vice President of Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. And um, today we have um, Mr. Carl Gershman, the President of National Endowment for Democracy. Um, Ambassador Derek Mitchell, the president of the National Democratic Institute, and um, Dr. Uh, Daniel Twining, um, the president of the International Republican Institute, um, Mr. Wilson, the executive director of the Center uh, for International Private Enterprises, and um, Michael Abramowitz, the president of Freedom House. Um, so, this is um, an important and timely panel um, because democracies around the world um, are ex either exper experiencing backsliding um, or uh, under intrusion. Um, so, we thought that today it is um, important for us to get together to discuss the extent to which how we could work together to safeguard democracy and the values that we treasure so much. Um, so. Um, it's really uh, a pleasure and um, an honor to have um, the esteemed um, colleagues um, joining us today. So um, I will start uh, with um, inviting um, the president of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy um, to have his uh, welcome mark uh, for the panel, and then uh, we could start uh, with this event. So um, President Huang. Uh, where you're on. Distinguished panelists and guests, morning and evening. I'm Yulin Huang, the president of Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. On behalf of the TFD, I want to thank you for joining us for this important virtual event. Democracies around the world are under assault. Authoritarian regimes are using disinformation, economic pressure, military exercise, and even gray zone operations to undermine the value we treasure so much. This worrisome trend also makes today's virtual event more timely and essential. Therefore, it's a privilege for us to join force with National Endowment for Democracy, National Democratic Institute, International Republican Institute, Center for International Private Enterprise, and Freedom House to discuss how we can more effectively safeguard democracy. As we saw the COVID-19 pandemic severely affect Indo-Asia, just over the past year, we have seen authoritarian regime took advantage of the pandemic to curtail human rights and expand their power. Civic space continued to shrink in the region. International NGO that advocates for democracy and human rights are also facing increased threat and challenges. At the same time, Taiwan has shown that democracy can deal with pandemic effectively. Since early this year, Taiwan also became home to many international NGOs, including regional offices of NDI and IRI. Taiwan is a leading democracy and one of the most open society in the Indo-Pacific region. And we aspire to play a greater role to protect and promote the shared values of democracy with our fellow advocates from around the world. I want to thank the participants and audience again for attending the event today. I look forward to the fruitful discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, President Yang, uh, uh, President Huang, for um, his um, introduction and the welcoming remark for um, the event. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, um, my name is Kelly Chen. I'm the Vice President of Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, uh, responsible for national cooperation, and I will be the moderator for today's panel. Um, uh, since um, President Young mentioned, um, democracy around the world um, are facing unprecedented challenges and, of course, um, backslidings and attack. And um, especially uh, with last year uh, because the COVID-19 pandemic and authoritarian regimes have been taking advantage of the epidemic um, to further tighten restrictions of fundamental human rights, um, such as freedom of speech, uh, role of the media, um, and um, even more seriously, uh, trying to discredit democratic independence um, uh, very, very aggressively. And um, um, disinformation um, aimed at dismantling our values and creating doubts of um, the democratic ideals um, permeated uh, social media and civic space for um, international NGOs continue to shrink. Um, and especially for those that advocate for democracy um, and human rights. Um, however, at the same time, um, Taiwan has been um, relatively successful uh, combating the COVID-19 pandemic um, and without uh, intruding on um, democratic institutions and procedures. Um, and um, as President Huang mentioned, uh, international NGOs are increasingly turning to Taiwan um, as a location and a hub uh, to, um, to conduct their work. So, um, therefore, it is um, my pleasure and honor to invite esteemed panelists to join us um, for this online event to discuss um, the worries and trend and how we can work together uh, to combat uh, such uh, intrusion. So, um, let me um, briefly introduce um, our panelists to the audience members, uh, even though I know um, for all of you guys and the work that you um, you have done in the past decades, you really don't need uh, a lot of introduction. Um, so first we have um, Carl Gershman. He is the president of the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, prior to assuming his uh, position with the endowment in, in 1987, Mr. Gershman was the senior counselor to the United States representative to the United Nation. And he served, he also served as the US representative to the UN's third committee that deals with human rights issues. He was also the alternate representative of the United States to the UN Security Council. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Derek Mitchell. Um, Ambassador Mitchell is the president of the National Democratic Institute. Um, he turned to um, NDI in uh, 2018. Um, prior to that, he served as the United States Ambassador to the Republic of the Union of Myanmar, or Burma. Um, he was the first American ambassador uh, to the country in 22 years. Um, prior to that, he served as the U.S. Department of State's first special representative and policy coordinator uh, for Burma. Uh, with the rank of uh, ambassador. And of course, um, he has a very extensive uh, career um, in the US government. Um, he served as the principal deputy assistant, secretary of defense, Asia and uh, Pacific Council Affairs in the office of the secretary of defense. Um, he also served as a senior fellow and director of the Asia division um, for the international security program at CSIS. Um, next, we have Dr. Daniel Twining. Um, he is the president of the, the International Republican Institute. Um, he joined um, IRI in uh, 2017, and he leads the Institute's mission uh, for advancing democracy and freedom around the world. Um, and he is the head of the IRI's team of over 700 global experts to link people and to motivate people to engage in the political process um, and to guide politicians and government officials uh, to uh, be responsive uh, to citizens. Um, prior um, to that, um, Dr. Twining served um, as counselor to the president and director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund um, of the United States. Um, and he also served 
as a member of U.S. Secretary of State's policy planning um, as a staff and a foreign policy advisor to um, U.S. Senator John McCain. Um, next, we have Mr. Andrew Wilson, um, Executive Director for the Center for International Private uh, Enterprise. Um, Andrew Wilson um, has um, extensive experience working with the private sector on development issues in conflict and post-conflict settings. And um, he also worked uh, in crafting successful business strategies to reduce corruption, um, encouraging entrepreneurship development, strengthening business advocacy, and improving uh, corporate governance standards. Um, so uh, Mr. Wilson worked at SIPE since 1996 um, uh, within a variety of uh, capacities. Um, last, we have the president of Freedom House, uh, Mr. Michael Abramowitz. Um, he uh, joined Freedom House in uh, 2017, um, and prior to that, he was the director of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Levine Institute for Holocaust Education. Um, he led the museum's genocide prevention efforts, um, and he oversaw um, the museum's public education programs. So, as you could see, we have a very esteemed um, and very experienced uh, panelist uh, for today's panel. So, um, just a bit of a, a, a agenda for today. Um, we will have the speakers to give um, uh, some opening thoughts and remark uh, for five minutes. And then afterwards, we um, would, could open up um, the floor for question and answer. And I also, as a moderator, um, I want to take some advantage to ask you guys some questions that we would like to hear from you. So first, may I invite um, Carl uh, to say a few words? Thank you. Thank you, Katie, and uh, thanks for uh, putting together this meeting, bringing us all together. And as uh, President Huang said, good morning to you and good evening to us. Uh, we're, we're very far apart, but it's great to be able to do this. I've been asked to say a few words both about the history um, of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, and I, I had something to do with that, as you know, uh, and also about the challenges today. Um, the starting point for our relationship was this major conference that we put on with the Institute for National Policy Research in 1995, when we brought together uh, 60 of the most important political scientists and thinkers uh, in the world, including uh, Robert Dahl, Samuel Huntington, Seymour Martin Lipset, Juan Linz, and, and others uh, to celebrate Taiwan as a, to think about the third wave of democratization and to celebrate Taiwan as a leading third wave democracy because its transition to democracy took place in the 1980s and the 1990s when the third wave had reached its peak. And that conference led to um, publication of a two volume uh, collection of this, the papers called the Global Resurgence of Democracy. It was a very optimistic time for democracy. And we followed that up just the following year by having an event in the Congress honoring uh, Li Dong Wei, who was the first democratically elected president of Taiwan. And it was the largest event that the NED ever held in the Congress. It was addressed by seven senators and 15 members of Congress, and there were an equal number of, of senators and members of Congress uh, in the audience. Uh, speakers included Tom Daschle, who uh, was the minority leader at the time in the Senate, uh, and uh, committee chairman in the, uh, in, in the House, Ben Gilman, Bob Livingston, Gerald Solomon. It was a great event. And the following year, we, we brought together uh, leaders from 19 different countries, leading countries around the world. Uh, we, did, we worked again with the Institute for National Policy Research to, to talk about how other countries could establish democracy foundations. Uh, and then uh, at the assembly, the second assembly of the World Movement for Democracy in 2000, which was held in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Newly elected President uh, Chen Shui Bien sent a message to the assembly uh, in which he announced that Taiwan would establish its first, the first democracy foundation in Asia. Um, and the, T the TFD was formally uh, inaugurated on June 17, 2003, 
and our cooperation since then has been strong and it has been continuous. Uh, yet, as you know, as we know, and as you talked to, about, Ketty, uh, today, uh, democracy is being challenged as never before. I'm sure Michael Bronowitz will talk about the latest Freedom House report, which shows the most negative trends in the 48 years that this survey, uh, since this survey was started. Um, and this year, uh, our last year, 2020, marked the 15th consecutive year of decline in global freedom uh, with countries where freedom deteriorated, outnumbering those where it improved by the largest margin since this negative trend began in 15 years. Now, we have a newly elected president in the United States who is, you know, one of his primary objectives is to reverse this trend, this negative trend for democracy, and to put democracy back on the global agenda to restore American leadership and also to strengthen uh, U.S. alliances. And I believe that Taiwan and the TFD can, very, can play a very, very important role in this effort to reverse the decline of democracy. And I'd like to just, in conclusion, highlight three fundamental dimensions of what this role might consist of. And the first is as a democratic model uh, for the world. China, China's rise as a dictatorship and the threat that China now poses uh, to countries in East Asia and beyond uh, have given the democratic system established in Taiwan so successfully a much larger significance than it had at any other time. Taiwan's success in dealing, uh, as President Huang said, with COVID-19 sends the message about the capacity of a democracy to deal effectively with such a challenge. And in addition, I think, the fact that the TFD exists as the premier uh, democracy foundation in Asia sends the message to the world about the strength and the self-confidence of Taiwan's democracy. So that's very, very important. The second dimension is the work that the TFD does and can do. And I think there are three areas where the TFD can make a special contribution to strengthening democracy in the world. It's already a TFD, the Taiwan is already a leader in the field of e-governance. Um, and it has great experience in this field to share with the world. It's experience also as a prime target of Chinese cyber attacks enables Taiwan to help other countries defend themselves against malign, sharp power, uh, foreign influence, manipulation, and disinformation. And not least, Taiwan's experience, as I've already said, as a successful third wave democracy puts it in a position to share with other emerging democracies lessons about democratic transition. And this, of course, is critically important. And finally, Taiwan can, the, the TFD, I believe, can strengthen Taiwan's role as a democratic ally in helping to build democratic unity and cooperation in East Asia and beyond. It's already an important hub for democratic training and cooperation. And I think that's why NDI and IRI have established offices in Taiwan. And it will be the host uh, next year of the 11th Global Assembly of the World Movement for Democracy, giving it a platform to showcase its role as an important ally and uh, democratic ally and promoter of democracy. The theme of that assembly will be democratic transition. So having it in Taiwan as a successful third wave transitional country, I think is, is very, very important. I think the TFD has a large and important role to play. Uh, and I hope that the government of Taiwan will give the TFD the resources it needs that is commensurate with the challenges that it faces. The fact that the TFD has done so much over 18 years with so little, I mean, your budget is rather small, but you've done a great deal with that budget, I think. Uh, it shows that uh, the TFD is capable of managing a larger budget. And uh, I think if it gets that kind of a budget to do the kind of work I've talked about, I think Taiwan will benefit from a stronger TFD and so will, so will the world. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl, um, for uh 
going over um, the history of Taiwan's democratization process and also the founding uh, of TFD. And uh, thank you so much for your um, endorsement and confidence uh, for the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. Um, so next, we're going to welcome Ambassador um, Darius Mitchell to speak a few words. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, thank you, everybody. Good evening to folks back here in, in Washington. Good morning to friends out there in, in Taiwan. Let me just first say, well, thank you, Katie. Thank you to President Wong. Um, but let me associate myself with everything that Carl just said with regard to the TFD, which is a really important institution in Asia. And this was not coordinated, I guarantee you, but I, I second Carl's comment <laughs> about funding TFD, uh, ensuring that you are well resourced so you can expand this work uh, because it really is one of the foundational uh, efforts in Asia and um, I think very important to be seen around, around the world. Uh, let me just make two very broad points. First of all, as stated, this is a very challenging time for democracy around the world. There's no news there. Everyone gets that. It appears to be on the defensive in Asia in particular, as you look around Southeast and South Asia. Uh, my The country I used to be um, stationed in, Myanmar, is, is just the latest example of uh, kind of very, very sad regression that's occurred. Uh, and the temptation then is for opportunists and others to say, well, see, democracy is not natural to Asia. See, it's, it's not, democracy isn't taking root. And to that, I say, without being too blue, too late at night, bull. I mean, this is, the problem is not people's desire for democracy. That's clear. The problem is the old elites who refuse to make room for it. And we witnessed that happening, not just in Myanmar, but um, we saw uh, uh, movements in Malaysia, but even more so in Thailand and Cambodia, and of course, Hong Kong. People came out in the millions to demand their democratic rights. Uh, under enormous stress uh, in places, even Hong Kong before 2014, no one would have believed people of Hong Kong were interested in democracy. Of course not. They just care about the economy. Well, when it came down to it, they're willing uh, to, to put themselves on the line for democracy. And if people in Cambodia, and um, certainly we saw it in Thailand, when they're allowed to speak, we know what they're saying. And they overwhelm the elites that say that democracy isn't appropriate for some reason to these countries. Um, the problem is they don't have the hard power that authorities do, so they're suppressed. Uh, and that suppression may work in the near term, but these rulers lack legitimacy and they're afraid of their own people. These authoritarians top to bottom, whether it's in China or in Southeast Asia or elsewhere or in Russia, they're afraid of their own people. Uh, they, they're afraid of their legitimacy. And therefore, there's really a question of how sustainable their situation really is. So this is going to be a hard fight. It's not easy. There are no simple solutions to what's happening, but it is an essential one and one that we in the Ned family uh, seek to support in the interest of true peace, stability and development in the region, which is something I used to work on from the perspective of the Pentagon and perspective of sort of the hard uh, relationship aspect of things. But it is also what we're involved in in our democracy work um, around the world. And I should say, that it is a distinguished group that you see in front of you, but it is quite pale and male, as we say. Uh, there's um, women are essential to democracy. And I know Shauna Bader Blau, who's one of the Ned Core uh, presidents, she works on labor with the Solidarity Center, wanted to be here, but she couldn't. But I wanna make sure that, it is, uh, that everyone recognizes that this is something for everyone to be involved in. And this is, uh, women are core to this. We can talk about that even more further. Uh, in, in Q&A. But of course, the second point I want to make very quickly is that, is that Taiwan is really an essential part of the struggle, as Carl said, that Taiwan can play an essential role through its networks and otherwise. But it, it's an essential part of a lot of related issues of our time. When you look at Taiwan, um, it is a leader in digital innovation in a digital age. It is a leader in environmental responsibility in an age of climate change. It is a leader in quality health care and civic responsiveness in an age of infectious disease and a pandemic. And most importantly, as a strong Asian democracy, Taiwan is part of what I consider and what Carl talked about arguably is the defining issue of our time. What are the norms, the values, the standards, and the rules that will guide the international system in the 21st century? This is really up for grabs for the first time you can say in, since World War II, certainly since the Cold War. Will it be transparent, accountable, inclusive, and representative governance, 
or will be ruled by a corrupt illiberal few? Is it democracy or autocracy? The dignity of, an, of the individual versus the glory of the state. Um, and some refer to this as a great power competition or a US-China competition. And I would say to that, that that may be a necessary frame to get attention in some circles, the idea of great power competition. And in the United States, it's viewed in, in many circles that way. But my view is that form is too limiting. And in some ways, I would say disrespectful of Taiwan. This is not just about a struggle between great powers. This is about you know all peoples everywhere who want and deserve freedom and dignity for themselves, regardless of great powers. Taiwan has built a remarkable society for itself that deserves respect and that is a remarkable success story and needs to be honored for that purpose. As stated continually, you are a beacon on your own. Um, perhaps it can't help be seen in the context of cross-strait situation or the United States and China, but Taiwan should never be seen as a tool or a sideshow. The strength of Taiwan today, as I mentioned, is how much Taiwan is respected as Taiwan and not as a function of China or US-China relations or anything else. And I consider that a real opportunity for Taiwan um, as we work together to create a world that works for the freedom and dignity of all everywhere. So I just wanna thank you again, Ketty, and thank the TFD for the great work that you do and uh, look forward to partnership uh, and Q&A to further expand on these on these thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Mitchell, uh, for your statement. And um, I'm really glad that you brought up the issue um, of women. Um, in the past year, I actually joined um, quite a few panels uh, to discuss the effect of the pandemic on, on women's rights um, and um, and the role of women um, in in the combat, not only combating um, uh, the pandemic, but also um, building up trust and uh, democratic institutions um, in their respective countries. Um, and, um, so, so I, I thought that, um, the women's issue is also another issue that, um, uh, we could work together on. Um, and Taiwan has been very, um, uh, diligent, um, working towards, uh, and, and have some, uh, great accomplishment uh, on. Next, may I, uh, welcome the president of the International Republic Institute, uh, Dr. Twining, please. Thanks, Kenny. It's so great to be here uh, with you and my distinguished colleagues. Uh, just on the women's front, I mean, I would like to say, you know, we have a women's democracy network at IRI that works across nearly 90 countries, and it does feel like maybe it's time to open the Taiwan chapter. So uh, we will circle back with you uh, on that. But of course, democracy can't work well if half the half of any nation is not represented. And one, uh, I think, important example that Taiwan offers to the world is ob obviously is a very successful uh, female uh, leadership and empowerment. And that is one of the secrets of Taiwan's success. I thought Derek put it perfectly uh, on COVID, on environmental management, on responsive politics, uh, on really uh, managing the technological disruptions uh, that all democracies are uh, subject to uh, today. So I would just like to reinforce without echoing uh, what either Carl or Derek said, but just to kind of continue to um, expand the conversation here, that uh, of course it's true, authoritarian leaders fundamentally are afraid of their own people. Uh, they want to create a narrative that somehow uh, rule by might, by raw power, uh, through surveillance, through force, that that is the human way. Uh, and that uh, democratic practice, democratic governance is maybe something that uh, has worked in the past in the West, but really is not the future, that the future is this sort of techno-authoritarian, if you will. Uh, and of course, we know exactly the opposite of true, because we see people all over Asia and all over the world standing up. Uh, and it's not that they reject democracy. Actually, they want as much of it as they can get, and they want it to work better. That's true in the United States. It's really true uh, in every open society. Uh, and it's very true, uh, as Derek suggested, in uh, authoritarian states, including in Asia. So we should remember that uh, the CCP in particular, but authoritarians generally have a strategy of dividing us. And one thing small d Democrats need to do better and why the partnership with the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy is so important uh, is we need to work together. We need to work together because our open societies are subject to the same pressures. Uh, citizens who have very high expectations uh, for governance, for prosperity, for opportunity, 
uh, all of the technological displacements uh, that we have lived through, uh, the pandemic, uh, environmental concerns, whatever uh, a citizen's cause is, uh, he or she is only going to be able to advance that cause in a democracy, right? Where he or she has a voice, where he or she can hold uh, elected representatives accountable, uh, where he or she can organize uh, freely in civic association to uh, drive peaceful change. And so uh, we should remind ourselves, again, as small D Democrats, that the work of democracy is hard. It's not easy uh, and it's never done. Again, you've seen that in the United States. You see that all over the world. Uh, but more people than ever are mobilizing and agitating for greater rights and freedoms and dignity and politicians who listen to and are responsive to them. Uh, so that was the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing, just to uh, keep things moving here, is just to maybe highlight in a kind of a workmanlike way. Uh, and just, you know, IRI and NDI have both op opened offices in Taiwan. So maybe just to talk about that for just a minute. Uh, we really appreciate the support of your government and your society uh, for that, as well as obviously the partnership with TFD. Uh, we see our role really uh, with uh, uh, an, a physical operation in Taiwan uh, really as an opportunity to project across Asia, across the Indo-Pacific, across the region, including to tell uh, the story of Taiwan, Taiwan's own successes in managing very complex 21st century challenges that, again, all societies are grappling with these issues. And we really see Taiwan as a template and model for how to uh, make progress uh, uh, with these very difficult issues and really, uh, frankly, overperform uh, in important respects. Uh, we see, obviously, TFD as an integral partner uh, and obviously look forward to working much more closely with you again. We know that the CCP and others, uh, they want to foment democratic disunity. And one of the National Endowment for Democracy strategic goals is to uh, advance democratic unity. So that's really why we're all here, to work with you to advance democratic unity. Uh, I would like to echo the point that, of course, we hope uh, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy can receive even more support, even more resources to do more uh, that really, uh, if there was ever a time uh, to uh, double down on the struggle for freedom in the world, it's now. And Taiwan uh, is obviously a leading exemplar and voice in that. And so we do look forward to working with you, uh, hopefully, as you grow. And finally, last comment, uh, support for the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy should transcend politics, partisan politics, just like support for the National Endowment for Democracy for all of us represented here transcends partisan politics. Uh, that um, uh, these should not be political issues. We should all be able to agree on the importance of democracy in the world. We know from polling by the Penn Biden Center, the Bush Institute, Freedom House, other distinguished organizations that most Americans believe that our country should advance democracy and human rights in the world. Uh, this is not actually a contested proposition. And so similarly, we know that uh, all Taiwanese value living in a free and open society in which Taiwan has full international space and the autonomy and freedom to uh, live uh, in a free and open international system. And therefore, uh, support for TFD really should not be political or partisan. Uh, again, uh, many Republicans, Democrats, independents have uh, really done great work in supporting the National Endowment uh, of Democracy here in the United States for nearly 40 years. Uh, and that is really one of the secrets of its success and the uh, uh, enduring strengths that it brings to bear. So thank you, Kenny. It's great to be with you. Thank you very much, um, Dan. And um, I completely agree uh, with you on your last point that the support for democracy to transcend um, political ideologies. Um, we have members of different political parties and different ideologies um, as staff and vice presidents uh, working at TFD. Um, we um, and one of um, the things that we all agree with is that, um, you know, Taiwan's future is a democratic future and we will work together. Um, regardless of our political ideology to safeguard um, Taiwan as a place and democratic uh, institutions uh, for Taiwan. And, you know, just to um, for your reference, um, we conduct. Um, uh, people's uh, perspectives and people's feelings of democracy um, every year at the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. And 80 some percent, almost 90% of the Taiwanese that I polled supports 
the democratic institution, knowing that democracy is not perfect and there's always room for improvement, but that's the uh, political system that Taiwanese really want to live under. Um, so um, next, may I uh, welcome Executive Director Wilson uh, to say a few words. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie, and it's a pleasure to join you today. Uh, as always, it's always difficult following uh, Carl and, and Dan and, and Derek uh, and, and knowing that, that Mark is speaking after me that there is this is a, a real high powered group you've got here uh, and I can't do more than just associate myself with the with the comments that they've made and in particular the comments they've made about the importance of strong support for TFD. The importance of standing with Taiwan and Taiwanese democracy at this point in time. And I want to extend on behalf of, of our organization, our parent organization, the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, our heartfelt wishes to you and, and thanks for organizing this important event. You know, SIPE is a little unique. Uh, we we're a unique organization in the world in that we work at the uh, intersection of economic development, democracy, and human rights. And, and it may be a, a subject matter that's a, that's a, um, maybe not quite obvious for 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 some of our our, our participants today. So I thought maybe I I give you a little bit of our perspective uh, on how the issues the world is facing uh, are are working uh, out today as as we move forward. You know, it's a unique position from which we tackle some tough challenges from providing opportunities to marginalized groups to participate in the private sector to combating corruption. Uh, and addressing governance gaps resulting from what we call uh, corrosive capital. We've always been committed at site to building the infrastructure of democracy whose institutional fundamentals also serve as principles for a competitive and open marketplace. And these things include things like property rights and the rule of law. And I got to say that, you know, these days when we look at these issues and we look at the broader issues, we're seeing a, a greater synergy between business and democratic institutions around the world. Uh, you know, in the US, we're seeing the American business community really come to the forefront, uh, speaking up for democratic institutions uh, and the importance of democracy uh, as, as a precondition for business. And we also see this around the world where the, where the private sector is becoming one of the main drivers for democratization. And it's precisely because that they're seeing the value of things like the protection of property rights and the rule of law from a business perspective and why it makes a lot of sense to them open, fair, and competitive marketplaces make business sense. And they help the private sector to grow and create jobs, which lead to improved livelihoods for everybody. Uh, you know, and, and that's where the important point to be made here is that economic growth and democracy are interrelated. In our view, the private sector needs democracy and democracy needs the private sector. If the private sector doesn't grow, people don't see the dividends from the hard work of democracy and it's really at that point really easy to lose hope for the promise of democracy. You know, democracy is not only about defending our rights and values, and I, th I think uh, the, my, my fellow panelists have, have brought this out very importantly, but it's also really important about bringing food to the table so that democracy delivers for everybody. And it's within the, in the democracy promotion community, we think it is key to offer opportunities and prosperity through private sector development and market oriented reforms. And the results of this then go to legitimize democracy. You know, our approach at SIPE is, is one that focuses on what we call ecosystems for enterprise. And this includes things such as the policy and regulatory environment, support for entrepreneurship, rule of law issues, and contract enforceability. These that are also fundamental to the fabric of democracy. On the topic of combating corruption, SIPE understands that winning the support of the private sector means we're making a plausible business case to entrepreneurs and that the solutions proposed are actually grounded in local context so that in the end, these initiatives are driven and sustained by the local private sector. When we encourage local responses to issues based on local business needs, our approach not only improves the business environment, but it reinforces democratic practice. The resulting growth means democracy can deliver on its promise and the process of transparent dialogue that has led to this growth really builds the muscle memory of democracy an understanding that open debate is critical element of democracy is free elections and institutional safeguards. But, you know, in recent years, we witnessed an alarming trend. Large amounts of capital backed by authoritarian regimes are flowing through opaque channels into emerging markets. 
in these markets where governance is already weak and corruption is already rampant, this high risk capital creates political and economic distortions, which often do more harm than good in the recipient country. We've coined the term corrosive capital to describe state backed financing, uh, like we see coming from China. Financing flowing without transparency and accountability from authoritarian states into new and fragile democracies. And I recall at an event that we organized uh, with you, TFT, in 2019, where we were invited to speak and share our approach to combating the effects of corrosive capital. And our work centers around identifying specific governance gaps. You know, Carl mentioned the importance of governance, e governance, and other forms of governance. In these governance gaps in countries where the democratic processes are at risk when this corrosive capital enters. It ignores environmental standards, it ignores labor standards, it ignores budget transparency. So what we do is we work with local partners where we design and implement projects that help close these gaps. It fosters collaboration among civil society and it brings information out to the private sector and lawmakers about how they can tighten up their safeguards when this kind of capital flows in. You know, Taiwan occupies a very special place on the world stage, and, and Taiwan's vibrant democracy is significant for many of the reasons that Carl and others have already laid out, whether it's your leadership in COVID, the way you've, you've made the transition uh, from, uh, from military rule to a mature democracy over the last uh, three decades, the inclusiveness of your society. There are a lot of things that you're doing here that are so important and, 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 and legitimize, I think, and, and strengthen the argument for democracy around the world. Uh, and we really want to see a, a further partnership with, with TFD in that regard, and in particular, looking at the issues where we can look at the role of the private sector in strengthening democracy, because Taiwan has a strong legacy in that as well. SIPE is boosting its presence in Taiwan. Uh, one of my colleagues has been there for several months, Kathy Tai, who I know is on this call right now, uh, a native of Taiwan. Kathy has been working the, has been working in Taiwan recently to help strengthen our presence on the ground, and we look forward to expanding that in the coming months and years. You know, our work is not is not just working throughout Southeast Asia. We're looking at how these issues play out across the Pacific Basin uh, and the Indo-Pacific. And we think Taiwan has a strong uh, uh, role to play there as a Pacific and Island nation itself. Uh, and we look forward to, to working with you at TFD on this moving forward. So thanks again, Kathy, uh, Ketty. It's been a great uh, opportunity to work with you in the past. And we really look forward to working with TFD in the future. Uh, if we don't stand with Taiwan now, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we're losing a great opportunity to spread the message of democracy around the world. Thanks a lot. Very much, um, Andrew. Um, I'm, I'm very glad um, you are able to join us um, on today's panel and um, explain and uh, to my to our audience um, what corrosive capital is and how important um, business enterprise and business is in supporting uh, democracy, um, especially under the current situation uh, with the with the pandemic. Um, so, last but not least, um, I would like to welcome um, President. Um, a Bomberwitz to say a few words uh, to our audience, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny, and good morning uh, to my friends in Asia and good evening to my friends in the United States. And thank you to President Huang uh, and, and the whole crew at the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy for organizing this event and being so kind as to allow me to crash the NED and the Institute party. So uh, let me let, thanks for letting me. Uh, be part of this, and uh, it's always a great honor for me to share the, uh, sta the well, the virtual stage at least with my friends uh, Dan, Derek, Andrew, and uh, Carl. Especially Carl, I think we all salute you as uh, kind of the godfather of the democracy, at least the modern democracy movement. And uh, wish you luck on your on your retirement. Um, Carl did beat me to the punch on kind of the st statistic, which. Sadly, I usually use with all my talks, which is that uh, democracy has you know, been declining for 15 consecutive years. Uh, when we released Freedom of the World a few months ago, uh, we added another kind of depressing statistic, which is uh, I think actually one of the more eye-popping statistics of our report this year, which is that less than 
of all people on earth live in what Freedom House would classify as a free country. That's a pretty sobering uh, statistic. However, every year we always try to look for the silver lining for the success stories. And I'm really pleased that to be on this panel with this organization uh, to really follow that kind of depressing news with a hopeful note, which is that Taiwan is beating the odds. Uh, this year, Taiwan earned a staggering 94 out of 100 points in freedom of the world. Uh, and uh, that makes Taiwan one of the freest countries, not just in Asia, but in the world. Freer, in fact, than the United States, according to freedom in the world. And as many of you know, and as some of the comments before me indicated, uh, that's, that was never a given. Uh, when we launched Freedom of the World as a project uh, in the early 1970s, uh, democracy was really in bad straits. Uh, uh, there, was the, there was the uh, communism had uh, dominated uh, Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, we had military dictatorships uh, uh, in many Asian countries and in Latin America. And in Taiwan, of course, uh, the Kuomintang ruled Taiwan by martial law. But it, by 2000, after decades of democratic reform and the emergence of a vibrant civil society, Taiwan managed the peaceful transfer of power from the Kuomintang to the Democratic Progressive Party. Uh, so we are, as my colleagues indicated, living through an era of democratic decline, both in Asia and around the world. Uh, and I think one thing that's very sad to us is that countries that had made democratic progress over uh, previous years, like Myanmar, as Derek indicated, India, that was a big, big story in freedom of the world this year, and Thailand are now regressing towards autocracy. Yet despite all that, Taiwan has resisted the pull of authoritarianism and really uh, remained an example of how a nation can transition from authoritarian rule to successful, sustainable democracy. And all this is happening in the face of mounting aggression intimidation and disinformation campaigns from Beijing. Taiwan has really stood strong, a bulwark of democracy in Asia and an inspiration uh, to all of us in the free world. In the middle of the pandemic, as we were talking about Kenny before, you know, when many governments, I was just astonished by the numbers uh, uh, in, in Taiwan, when many governments gave into the temptation, and this is something we've chronicled at Freedom House, to use pandemic control as a pretense to exert control over their citizens. Taiwan you know, was able to control the spread of COVID-19 without impinging on human and civil rights. And uh, also, I think it's noteworthy that in the early days of the outbreak, Taiwanese officials you know, uh, helped to counter the Chinese government's lack of transparency and really warned the world of the virus's potential for human-to-human -human transmission. And at the heart of all these successes is the robust relationship between Taiwan's government the private sector, and civil society. It is truly inspiring to me, all of this. And that's part of why I'm really happy that Freedom House over the next few years is gonna be further expanding our work on Taiwan. Over the next year, just as one small example, we're gonna be incorporating dedicated case studies on Taiwan into our annual Freedom on the Net report. And also as part of a new report that we've started uh, assessing Beijing's global media influence. Uh, and, and these projects will explore not only the challenges facing the internet and media freedom in Taiwan, but also the resilience of Taiwan's information environment, digital infrastructure, and privacy protections in the face of influence and infiltration efforts by Beijing. So thank you again uh, to the Taiwan uh, Foundation for Democracy for having me here tonight. And I really look forward to talking about these issues with you in greater depth. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you very right. much, um, Michael, uh, for um, your over uh, your your um, overview on um, your report and also um, spotlighting um, Taiwan's progress um, in the past year. Um, I I really would like to say that um, democracy um, and the freedom you see in Taiwan right now um, is the work um, of um, all the Taiwanese citizens. Um, and how Taiwan was able, is able to combat uh, the pandemic. It's also the work of all the Taiwanese citizens um, following instructions. Um, so um, not um, be influenced by um, 
the, the, the kind of disinformation that has been really permeating our social media multiple times a day and, um, and trusting that democratic institutions can really uh, combat um, uh, and to combat um, this pandemic and work through um, crisis. So, um, so thank you, um, our panelists, for your, your initial statements. Um, now, I would like uh, to start our discussion. Um, I am looking at um, the chat area to see if there's uh, some questions. Um, I've not. So, um, the participants, if you have any questions uh, for our um, speakers, please, you could type that in the chat box and I will um, read your questions um, to the participants and uh, for them to answer. Um, so, in the meantime, um, I would like to start by um, perhaps asking um, all of the speakers to, um, uh, to talk about um, some of the factors that you think um, is affecting um, the development or the lack of development um, of democracy and causing uh, backsliding, um, not only in our are in the Asia uh, region, but also um, uh, around the world. I know that um, all of you guys um, already point out the worst and trend that has been happening for the past decades. Um, so I, if, if you could elaborate on what you think um, are the variables and factors that, that's been causing um, this kind of uh, worrisome trend um, in the current world that we're living in. Um, so can I ask um, Carl, if you want to share some of your thoughts with us? Thank you, Kennedy. And uh, by the way, this, you know, we're all in agreement here, which is great, but I'm sure we can have an interesting discussion despite that. Um, and you've raised a really important question. Um, and, you know, we know what the factors have been as we go back and look at, um, you know, the past 20 years, because, you know, the 90s was considered, despite the fact that we had the Balkan Wars, and it was really a warning what happened in the Balkans with the violence against minorities. And, you know, there were two genocides in the 90s, and yet it was called a vacation from history um, because the United States was a, the, you know, the global power. Um, but really starting with 9-11, uh, you know, the Freedom House has the statistics starting in 2006 because the number of electoral democracies or democracies in the world maxed out in 2005. Um, but really the negative trends started in, you know, with 9-11 and the war on terrorism and the way the war on terrorism was used to, um, uh, to repress dissent and minorities. It was very, it started a fairly dangerous trend. And then we had the global financial crisis. And after that, you know, the rise of a uh, much more belligerent Russia um, and, of course, the rise of China. And we should never forget that, uh, you know, it was at a time when everyone in the West was looking at China and saying, you know, as China grew economically, it will liberalize. Um, it was Liu Xiaobo who was, you know, got the Nobel Prize uh, in 2011. Uh, that, you know, Lu Xiaobo warned that, and he did this in 2006 when everybody had this illusion, he warned that if China rose as a, as a dictatorship, uh, the way other countries in history had risen as dictatorships, and he mentioned Japan and the Soviet Union, but if it did that, it would threaten democracy in the whole world. And I think, you know, that too has now happened. Uh, China is now arguably um, the major threat to liberal democratic values in the world, because it's a much, much stronger and growing country than Russia. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, Russia makes a lot of trouble, but it doesn't really pose as large a threat. So democracy is, is really endangered. I mean, the, the one thing I worry about Taiwan is you've been, as Mike said, you've been very, very successful. Please don't get complacent. Um, please understand. I mean, you you saw the cover of the Economist just uh, two weeks ago. I think you know, last week's issue, the week before, uh, that Taiwan is the most dangerous place in the world. It's being threatened constantly um, by uh, by China, both militarily and through sharp power and uh, and so forth. But you know, it was uh, President Tsai who said in her um, a National Day address. 
the beginning of uh, 2019 uh, that the threats had made Taiwan stronger and more determined. Um, and as we look at you know, the threats that democracy faces today, you can look at hard power threats, you can look at technological threats, sharp power and so forth. But to me, the, and, and also of course, uh, threats to minority rights, uh, especially the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, but really in many, many places around the world. But the thing that worries me the most is the loss of real faith and confidence in democracy. Um, that it, there is really a crisis of confidence and faith. And I think that's reflected in the rise of illiberalism in the democracies, the attack coming on democracy, on the United States and its own democracy or democracies in Europe from internal forces, not just from China, although China and Russia try to, you know, stimulate these internal forces. So the most important thing, I think, is to, is to recover faith and confidence in the capacity of democracy to deal with these problems. And there, I think Taiwan can play a very, very important role, you know, because you're small, uh, not that small, by the way, you're three times the size of a country like Israel, which people talk about all the time, but still you are small relative to China. Um, and you represent values that has been said by everyone uh, that the dictatorship in China fears very much. And as Xi Jinping, you know, at the very onset of his rule in 2013, he issued this uh, internally, but then it became public, this document number nine, that basically said that uh, they're threatened by these values, but they call these values Western, foreign. But I think what Taiwan shows is that these values are not Western and foreign. These values are global and universal. Um, and I think it plays a very, very important role in that. So I think Taiwan has to step up uh, and help remind all of us it can't lose sight of it, you know, it can't lose, become complacent itself. And, you know, you have to remain eternally vigilant, as has been said, but it can also remind us of why, you know, why democracy has the capacity to deal with the kind of challenges that we face in today's world. And it's uh, very much, um, Carl, can I go back to um, Michael from Freedom House? Um, when you were talking about uh, your report, can you please um, also elaborate for um, for us and for the audience on um, the kind of variable that you're seeing um, in the uh, deterioration of democracies um, in the past few years? Um, um, you know the factors that cause um, such worrisome uh, trend, and how you think that we could work together to um, combat um, such worrisome trend. Sure, thank you for that question, Kenny. I, I think there have been hundreds of books that have been written about this subject over the last several years, and uh, you know it's hard to kind of uh, you know, you know put the put your finger on one single cause for this. You know, they're economic, they're cultural, uh, uh, technological causes. Um, I, I certainly think that one thing that I would just kind of emphasize is that. You have a problem of, of authoritarian countries, and I would just point out, you know, the issue with China. China has actually become more repressive over time. Uh, you know, in 10 years ago, China earned a score of 17 out of 100 on freedom in the world. And you might think, well, that could hardly get worse than that. But in fact, China last year scored actually nine. So it really dropped almost 50%. Uh, from a very low base. So that's that's quite concerning. But the issue that I would say about China that's also concerning, uh, which highlights an issue which we've been really tracking closely at Freedom House, which is what I might call the globalization of repression. Uh, I, I believe that each one, each of us on this panel, uh, I don't know about Andrew, but I certainly think the other four have, have each been sanctioned by China. Uh, we can't travel to China. Uh, we can't uh, uh, we can't bank in China. Not that I particularly want to bank there, but I think the I, I think the point is is that uh, you know we are being sanctioned by you know speaking up for the rights of the Chinese people, uh, and and that's really quite scary to me. Freedom House did a very significant report about three months ago called uh, "Out of Sight but Not Out of Reach." And this chronicled the something called what we call transnational repression, 
which is the practice of authoritarian countries reaching beyond uh, its borders to target their dissidents, uh, their critics in the diaspora. Uh, the most famous example of this is what the Saudi government did in uh, essentially commissioning the murder of, of uh, the journalist Jamal Khashoggi in a Turkish uh, consulate. But that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's going on there. You know, Uyghur communities in the diaspora uh, and other uh, uh, others are really at the mercy of uh, and quite scared about countries like China, Russia, Iran, Turkey, uh, even tiny Rwanda and Africa has become known for targeting uh, their enemies beyond their borders outside of normal judicial mechanisms. So I think the point that, that I like that I make is that just because you're in a democracy does not mean you're safe. And, I, and, and while it's a scary thing, I hope that it's also a wake up call for the world in terms of really uh, understanding that the threat uh, to uh, to democracy is not just over there, but it's within our own societies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for um, your comment. And um, I really um, would like to echo um, Carl and uh, Michael's point of um, democracies um, cannot be complacent. Um, most of the uh, individuals, young people in Taiwan, um, they were born after uh, Taiwan's uh, white terror era. So um, they've not lived through um, what Taiwan was, but our um, older generation um, did. Um, however, um, even, even if the um, youth population have not lived through um, uh, what what was what happened a um, few decades ago. Um, their support for democracy and the current system that they are living in um, is tremendous tremendously high. And then and um, from our survey, um, you see um, the heightened of support for democracy after they witnessed what was happening in Hong Kong and making connection with the young um, uh, in Hong Kong. So. Um, I, I sincerely hope that um, Democrats around the world are not uh, are not going to be complacent, so this worrisome trend um, doesn't continue. Um, and um, in response to um, the Alliance for Democracies um, Copenhagen Democracy Forum that happened a few days ago, uh, the Chinese spokeswoman uh, um, said that not only um, does China has uh, true democracy. Um, that democracy is not something that um, uh, people just get together and uh, have some talks um, and um, and be done with it. So um, so with with such comments, um, I want to turn to um, Dan and Derek. On um, um, I think that uh, both of your institutions are uh, estab uh, established offices uh, in Taiwan, taking action on safeguarding and promoting democracy in our region. Um, and hopefully um, around the world. Um, can you also elaborate on um, uh, the extent to which your decisions to establish your office in Taiwan and your expectation um, with, um, with, with um, having the office in Taiwan? Can I have uh, uh, Dan, uh, can you talk about that, uh, elaborate that a bit more? Yes. You know, I think Derek made a good point earlier, Ketty, which is that um, we're not interested in democracy simply because it is part of some US China great game. Of course, you know, the NED, Freedom House, other esteemed organizations, here I NDI, were established long before there was a US China strategic competition. In fact, we were essentially allied with the PRC until uh, 1989 and Tiananmen Square. So uh, we do what we do because we care about human dignity, and we know that this is a powerful force that makes the world safer and more prosperous and better. Um, uh, but we do want to support Taiwan, uh, help strengthen the example of its democracy, learn from Taiwanese partners how uh, you have successfully managed the disinformation assault from China, uh, the Chinese attempt to uh, influence uh, and undermine free and fair elections in Taiwan. The good work you've done in Taiwan around civic education, uh, which is something I think we all need in our countries, which is, you know, a really highly informed citizenry that is able to distinguish real content online, real news and objective analysis with uh, manufactured forms of foreign disinformation uh, and misinformation. 
So we do, uh, we do believe Taiwan has uh, many lessons that others uh, can learn, and we would like to work with Taiwanese friends and partners, frankly, to share uh, those lessons. Kenny, can I also just say something, um, which is that uh, in addition to all the moral reasons that I think all of us care about democracy, and why we obviously want to protect and sustain and nurture it, including as it is under assault and there is backsliding, is that there are some pretty practical reasons uh, we should care, including in the context of the kind of security dilemmas that Taiwan and the US are in with China and just sort of general uh, broader interest-based concerns, which is that democracies historically have been shown to be more resilient than one-man systems or one-party systems. They are more innovative they produce the kind of world changing and society altering inventions that can enhance uh, prosperity and peace and human welfare. Um, uh, our societies are much more open to ideas uh, uh, in ways that frankly make us more modern than closed systems. And so I think on the one hand, all of us here talking are very worried about the vulnerabilities of our open societies. Taiwan, the United States, others, to uh, disinformation, to foreign authoritarian assault, to polarization and uh, extremist voices at home. But we shouldn't, uh, as Carl has said, we shouldn't lose faith in democracy. We shouldn't underestimate the fact that actually um, our adversaries see our systems as being highly competitive, which is why they are running global campaigns to degrade democracy. So I would say we should care about democracy, partly because it's the right thing to do, but also because uh, adversaries that do not wish us well, they also care about democracy, except that they want to undermine and weaken uh, and drive uh, wedges and divisions within our societies. So that's another reason uh, to uh, care, of course, about US-Taiwan partnership, about the kind of work that IRI and MDI want to do uh, with Taiwanese partners, and about really the, the decade ahead that we are looking at it. Um, Derek? Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, and I agree with everything that, that Dan just said. Um, I mean, the, the fact is, I mean, you asked earlier, I'll get to the issue of our office, but you asked earlier and we discussed earlier about the regression and why that's happening. And I think one of the reasons um, is a lack of will and a lack of recognition of the importance of democracy by the democracies of the world. Uh, and, you know, as Dan suggests, I think the, the authoritarian see an opening now and they're trying to push through and show that they're confident. They're the wave of the future. Russia talks about liberalism is dead, you know, and China says, you know, get used to it. We're the future and those Americans are divided and they're the past. Um, and they're just trying to undermine everyone's confidence. And we have to push back on that and affirm why this is important. And I think the Biden administration can do even more on that. Uh, the rhetoric is good, but they have to, every component of it has to recognize that this is not just values as a nice thing, but a real hard uh, interest of ours to to shape the norms and, and, and standards of the future, but also ensure that the countries are, are structured in a way that lead to better outcomes, more stable outcomes for a more stable world. It's a very practical, realist thing to support democracy. Uh, and I think what we've seen is that we haven't really, we failed to impose enough cost as a democracy community on those who are repressed. Um, and they see there's no cost. So other countries say, well, you know, there's no cost to it. We see we get uh, encouragement from the Chinas of the world. Well, then we can do it. We can suppress our people through force, et cetera. So it's a vicious cycle and we have to reverse that. And that's why partnership with beacons with, with strong democracies like Taiwan and others in Japan and Korea uh, and others is so urgent. And which gets to why we have an office there. Um, I mean, it, Taiwan is a welcoming environment. It is a first world country. It is a place where we can we are going to be uh, we can work closely with the TFD, the only democracy foundation in Asia. Why wouldn't we want to be working side by side with a TFD? Um, it it you know you have thriving democratic institutions. You have uh, stability. You have respect for human rights and freedom of speech. All the things that we would look for. What we're looking to do typically we go to a country and we have an office there because. We want to work in that country on that democracy. But in this case, it would be about working in partnership with a more developed democracy that we're all our works in progress and Taiwan can do more. Taiwan's working on open parliamentary uh, uh, activity as part of the open um, uh, democratic partnership, uh, open government partnership. 
Uh, so we all can get better, but showing that solidarity, figuring out how we partner and then bringing that to other countries um, and doing it on a regional basis, I think uh, offers a real opportunity and having an operational hub in Asia, in Taiwan, just works really well for that. I should also say, you have a woman president, <laughs> you have an active youth, uh, you are, as I talked about, vibrant civic tech, uh, vibrant civil society that was essential to the pandemic response and the, the marriage of technology and civil society. These are things that we want to uh, build on uh, and things that we need to learn from in the United States, to be honest, and that we can bring to places in Europe and, and elsewhere. So it's just an obvious choice that we would want to work much more closely on a daily basis with our friends and partners in Taiwan who are doing such great things. Thank you very much, um, um, Derek. Um, I, I want to um, go to Andrew um, and ask you some um, questions about corrosive capital um, and the work of SIPE. Um, but I see that there is a question um, from the audience. Um, so I will uh, ask, um, this question, um, I think it's for Michael, uh, from, um, our participant, Zhihao, uh, Yo. he is, um, he is, uh, with the, he's a co-founder of the international, uh, uh, information operation research. Group. Um, he said, um, Chinese influence operation is something that my organization is working to expose since 2019. We try to use scientific research. Um, to do this exactly because of the value NDI President Mitchell mentioned, transparency and accountability, and to better inform the public. So for um, Michael, how does Freedom House plan to, um, to understand Chinese influence in the upcoming uh, project, uh, Michael, you mentioned, and how can we better communicate with the public? Uh, well, thank you for that question. Uh, one of the issues that we've uh, looked at closely at Freedom House over the last several years, but it's also, I think, a subject that the NED and NDI and IR have also looked at is essentially, you know, Beijing's uh, increasing assertiveness and efforts to kind of uh, shape the information landscape, not just within China and the Great China Firewall, but also outside the country. So this can range from things such as, you know, you know, disinformation campaigns and efforts to manipulate search results online. Uh, it can be involved in, you know, trying to suppress critical coverage in overseas Chinese language publications. Uh, it's even, you know, Beijing getting influence over certain parts of countries uh, information infrastructure. So it's a range of different tactics that have been identified. And so essentially what we want to do, and we're just in the early stages of the project, is 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 just look more deeply at what's happening, you know, on the ground in uh you know several dozen countries and just you know take a closer look at you know what China is actually doing in the inside these countries and also what what kind of resilience the countries are 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 building up to uh either uh uh, rebuff that kind of influence or or to or to allow that to continue. So we're really just at the very early stages of this project and we'd be happy to uh, uh happy to have my staff uh you know interact with, with your organization uh to trade notes and, and, and see if there's you know any opportunities for exchange of information. Thank you very much. Um we we could definitely um connect uh, Freedom House with the information operation research group. Um these are a group of young people uh, in Taiwan who are doing um, a wonderful work on tracing the source of um, disinformation and also analyzing behavior of um, of these disinformation and um, and how they behave in uh, social media and Taiwanese's uh, traditional um, media. So, um, so if I could um, ask Andrew a question about Psych, um, you you guys have done a lot of um, uh, wonderful work on corrosive capital. Um, can you please um, tell us a bit of, um, uh, as you mentioned before, how um, this line of work um, uh, started? And then I understand that you have several uh, reports coming out on various parts of, of the world on gross, um, corrosive capital and its behavior. Can you please elaborate for us um, 
why um, caring about corrosive capital is, is, is very essential for the wellness of democracy um, and some of your findings so far. Yeah, thanks, Katie. You know, Carl's comments earlier at the outset of, 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 of our, our debate here, where he discussed the, the sort of competition of ideas of liberal democracy. I think what we need to, to realize, too, that the, 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 the competition of ideas also goes down into the fundamentals of how the world economy works. Uh, and what we've seen in the last oh, four or five years is a real competition of ideas. Um, one of which is is the traditional liberal democratic model of of global trade globalism, which is based on norms and rules and 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 open and free competition, the rule of law and fair systems, and frankly, uh, an economic system that exists solely to prop up uh, authoritarian regimes um, by by um, spreading uh, poor business practice. Um, throughout the world that, that, that lacks transparency, that is inherently unfair, that exploits labor and environmental uh, issues, and is doing so at the expense of the people who live uh, in the countries receiving this type of investment. And I want to I be very clear here that we're not just talking about a, the Belt and Road Initiative coming out of China, although the Belt and Road is probably the, the, the most prominent of, of these trends. But we've studied these as private investment flows. We've studied them as criminal investment flows. They don't just come from China. They come from Russia. They come from uh, the Gulf states. And they're often also tied to, to political goals uh, and foreign policy goals of countries moving forward. So uh, the NED itself has uh, put out some very good studies on what they call sharp power. Corrosive capital is one element of sharp power. Where, where states can, can utilize any number of tools. So, for instance, uh, if we look at Russia uh, in, in Eastern Europe and, and in Southeastern Europe, Russian investment may not be heavy in that region, but it's concentrated into places like the energy sector or the media, places where effective political control can be exercised. Chinese investment uh, it has really, it really differs in a lot of ways from, from the Russian efforts. Uh, in, in that there are both domestic uh, economic considerations driving some of this as a sort of an export of excess capacity going into markets. It's an extension of corruption of the Chinese state and Chinese state lending institutions uh, into these markets. Uh, but in the end, why we call it corrosive is that it eats away at the rule of law in the countries where the money ends up. So if we look at investments into Ethiopia or to Kenya, say if we look at Kenya and the, and the railroad that China financed the, the building of, uh, we see a lot of, a lot of um, illegal environmental practice, uh, labor practice, et cetera. Um, we've been doing studies. Uh, the approach we're taking towards this is to work with local groups because it's our local partners. Frankly, it was our local partners in Southeast Asia who came to us first about, about four or five years ago and said, look, we're getting this this huge influx of Chinese capital coming into our markets. We don't understand where it's coming from. We don't understand what its potential impact. What we do understand is we're taking loans that we're gonna to have to pay back, uh, that, that these loans are collateralized. These aren't traditional debt instruments that are being used. Uh, and we're concerned that they're also feeding into corruption. So what we did is we started studying these types of investments and what's happening in, in a variety of countries with policy groups and, and think tanks within the region. And what we, what we looked at was a variety of types of investments. So uh, in, in Malaysia, it was the traditional Belt and Road type projects, the infrastructure projects. In Thailand, we looked at the effect of the tourism sector uh, and how the Chinese were using uh, tourism spending as, as leverage on foreign policy. And we've seen them use this in places like Palau and other places in the Pacific as well. Um, in the Philippines, we were actually looking at criminal activity from China. Uh, online gambling and the effect that was having uh, on the Philippines is the Chinese exported the illegal activity they no longer wanted on the mainland. They, they, they offshored it into, into the Philippines. Uh, in Vietnam, we, we looked at how uh, the Chinese were, were gifting dirty coal power plants to Vietnam that the Vietnamese didn't even really want. It was outdated technology. They were exporting pollution, uh, essentially, into these markets. And every time it was trying to figure out how did that investment land there? Why, why wasn't, you know, a, a major, there's a major actually story in the, in the press a few weeks ago about a, a nickel smelter in Indonesia 
Western investors have been trying to build an, a nickel smelter in Indonesia for about 20 years. And yet the Chinese were able to do it in six months. The reason why uh, is because the Western companies were following the rules. And ultimately what this comes down to is what sort of economic model do we want our companies to be able to compete in moving forward? Do we want one that's based on fair competition and open markets and rule of law? Or do we want one based on the shadows? Uh, and and you know, generally speaking, uh, if you're in a recipient country, the constructive capital, as we call it, is the capital that's going to come in. It's going to follow the rules. It's going to stay. It's going to generate wealth over generations. Corrosive capital, easy in, dirty, easy out. Uh, and in the end, the recipient countries end up paying the bill for it. Um, so, um, you know, we, 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 we know that Taiwan is a very important investor in the region. We know that the Taiwanese are looking to diversify their own investments in the region. And we think Taiwan can be an important partner in promoting uh, fair competition and rule of law in the region. Uh, and we look forward to working with partners in Taiwan on trying to uh, extend this constructive capital approach. Thank you very much, um, Andrew. Um, as I recall, um, the session uh, from SIP in, in two years ago um, on corrosive capital uh, generated a lot of interest and, and uh, questions from uh, the participants. Um, I, I also look forward to working uh, with SIP to um, make more people, um, companies, uh, private enterprises aware of this kind of behavior um, and um, have. Um, comments, recommendations um, from Cyphone, how they um, will deal with um, such uh, trend um, from authoritarian countries and, and regimes. Um, I, we have um, one more question from, uh, from the audience about imposing costs on the authoritarian regimes, like, like um, Ambassador Mitchell uh, just said. Um, the audience member um, D will ask if there is any policy tools that we have not explored it thus far in order to impose costs on authoritarianism. Um, Ambassador Mitchell, would you like to uh, start answering that question? Well, it is a very difficult question. It's not a matter of any policy tools that we ourselves alone haven't have imposed, because in various cases, we have imposed a number of policy tools. And it gets complicated now because you do have China you do have the bigger countries that if you decide to impose a cost on a smaller country, then China loves the, the opportunity. They, they thrive on opportunism when, when there's a vacuum to come in and say, oh, we can help you on this. Um, but I think the, the key, as I said, is, is about uh, establishing a kind of uh, network. And you know, if, if it can't be business as usual, for instance, in, the, in Europe, uh, simply because of economic interests, short-term economic interests, or Japan, for that matter, though Japan is coming around and Europe is coming around and Germany is coming around on this finally, um, to recognize that it works against their interests to try to operate in corrupt environments simply to take to placate uh, companies, because of what Andrew talked about, that in these in these situations, typically um, the Chinese and others are, will compete better, uh, and in the long run, it will not be will not work to our benefit. Um, so I think. The more that we can work together to impose at least, you know, contribute to more exposing uh, transparency with free media to expose what's going on. The thing they, they like the least is when these things are shown in light and they're exposed. They want to work in the shadows. The best thing you can do is uh, and to impose a cost is to empower civil society or somehow find media and others who can expose what's going on. Um, and then, as I say, shaping the standards. That we, if we're working together affirmatively, not simply being on the defensive and trying to prevent China from doing this or Russia and China because they're working together in concert to shape certain standards, we have to work urgently together to think about what are those standards and norms that we are going to lay down and then force them to have to conform to. And the good thing about it is it's a win win for us. It, it wins in terms of our allying ourselves with the billions of people around the world that want to know what's going on in their own societies. That don't want corruption in their in their societies, but it's also a win for our companies because uh, those are environments which our companies can't compete. So I think we push back and impose a cost simply by doing what we do better and recognizing that what we do is strategic, uh, and that it works over the long term to our benefit rather than thinking short term by making deals with authoritarian regimes 
or investment agreements with China when, um, you know, it, it ultimately will not work out for us. Thank you very much. I think um, um, as um, our session coming um, to an end, um, Derek, your comment really leads um, very nicely into the last part of our conversation. Um, how can we um, work together uh, in order uh, to combat um, the trend that we have been talking about in the past hour. So, um, for the, uh, for the, the last part of, um, our session, um, I would like, um, all of the panelists to give us the, uh, some thoughts, uh, to end, um, our event with, and by no means, this is the only time that we are getting together in order to discuss how we could, um, better work together and, and help. Um, with the um, situation on democracy around the world. So, um, Carl, I'd like to share some of your um, last thoughts um, with us before we go off air. Well, thanks. You said, how can we work together? Um, you know, it's interesting. We're having this discussion tonight uh, with Taiwan. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had a visit by a group of six leaders of civil society from Ukraine. Um, and it's a very interesting parallel between these two countries today um, because they're both uh, threatened um, by large adversaries, which are the principal authoritarian countries in the world. Russia uh, really seeing an independent and successful Ukraine as a, as a threat to its own uh, security and is threatening it militarily. Um, and of course, Ta China and Taiwan, we've already uh, talked about. And there is a lot of talk about the way that these two authoritarian countries are cooperating with each other to make it more difficult for Biden, for example, to uh, have a democracy policy by giving him a kind of a two front conflict. Um, and there's a lot of evidence and uh, I've read it. It's intelligence evidence that was in you know publications uh, that uh, Xi Jinping and Putin and their uh, cohorts are collaborating with each other very, very consciously, very deliberately. And I think what that leads me to believe is that it's important, you know, for the democracy, the democratic cooperation, cooperation to take place on a larger scale. You know, we in the United States and in Washington have the benefit of, of really being required to have a global perspective um, and in the way we work, whereas you know, a lot of other countries have more regional perspectives. Um, but I think it's possible through our cooperation uh, to try to establish broader linkages. In other words, it would seem to me wonderful for a dialogue to take place between the kind of people we met with in Ukraine yesterday and Taiwan to talk about, because you're, you're both trying to resist uh, these threats. Um, you both face a lot of similar problems in terms of um, uh, disinformation, in terms of human rights, in terms of free media. Uh, the collaboration that could take place is to me very, very interesting. And we perhaps in the United States can help establish these, uh, these connections. And I hope that we can think about this meeting uh, of the world movement that is gonna take place in Taiwan next year, the 11th Global Assembly, as a way to establish those linkages much more uh, consciously uh, so that we can get people from who are part of these struggles very far away from you, but they actually have a lot in common with your struggle. And, and frankly, um, you know, if you and, uh, you know, people in Ukraine, in Ukraine and in Russia and larger places have stronger relationships, I think that will not only help you, but it was also, you know, there was a question before about imposing costs. I think this would really impose a cost on the authoritarian countries because it would make their ability to control uh, the situation uh, much more uh, much more difficult. Thank you um, very much. Um, President Twining, your last thoughts? I'll just be very quick since we're out of time. I would say one, expose corruption. Let's work together to expose corruption, which is the Achilles heel of authoritarian regimes. Uh, two, let's make technology work for democracy. These new internet tools should not be empowering dictators. They should be empowering free people. So let's really collaborate. And I think Taiwan has a lot to share there. And three, let's empower young people. 
you know, there are so many countries where old men essentially have been clinging on to power for decades, uh, including Russia, including a succession of old men in China, but including in Africa and other countries. Young people want something different. They know that to be modern is to live in an open, connected society. So let's focus in on them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Abamowitz, your last thoughts with us? Oh, me? I've got a thought. Yes. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Uh, uh, well, for a couple points. Number one, there are no quick bullets here. Uh, it's gonna. This is where I, I truly think we're in a generational struggle. We're, we're going to be talking about this 10, 15, 20 years from now. We have to be patient. I think number two. I think there are a lot of things that we can do uh, together uh, that are of a non-military, you know, means. I mean, sadly, uh, too many people around the world have come to associate. Uh, uh, democracy support, democracy protection, democracy promotion, whatever you call it, you know, with, with U.S. military intervention. And the Iraq war was, you know, more than 20 years ago. We just put out a report uh, with the McCain Institute and uh, CSIS on different ideas. Uh, you know, there are dozens of different ideas of things that we could do to help protect democracy. None of them had to do with the military. They had to do with supporting journalists, supporting civil society, uh, uh, fighting corruption. Uh, there's just a there's just a very aggressive, interesting, and innovative agenda out there. I think the final thing that I would say is that democracies have to heal themselves too. That we have to uh, uh, we have to deliver uh, uh, for our people each democracy in the United States, in Taiwan, in the other democracies of the world. That we have to show that democracy can deliver. You know, there's been a lot of talk uh, in the past uh, couple weeks in, in Washington, certainly about. The need for vaccine diplomacy. I think that's a great idea. Uh, you know, if the if if the world's democracies got together and made sure that over the next six months to a year, that you know, as many people on the face of the globe could get vaccinated, uh, and the democracies were seen as leading that effort, I think that'd be a great thing. <laughs> that'd be probably the single best thing for the cause of democracy that we could do over the next year. So I think delivering on democracy's promise is very essential. So thank you again, Katie, for including us in this conversation. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew, your last thoughts for us? Sure, I'll just um, you know restate the point I made earlier, which is to say, look, the nature of the private sector and its engagement in, in democracy is, has been changing very rapidly. There's, you know, uh, since 2008, really since, since the last three or four years, you look at the, the statements that are coming out of people like Jamie Dimon and, and other leaders in the United States and the US business community, but the European business community, uh, is all looking at, at a, a, a more fair uh, and competitive and rule of law based environment in the world. Taiwanese investment uh, can be a very powerful motivator for that, but we need to get Taiwanese companies engaged in this discussion. They need to understand that the, the values and the rule of law that have allowed them to prosper and their, in their home country really needs to be in the markets that they're investing into and they need to be they should be part of the solution along with other internationally invest, uh, um, uh, investing com companies and i think you know maybe one thing we can look at is how do we begin a business dialogue between taiwanese and uh, uh, companies and other international firms multinationals on these issues uh, so we can really chart uh, uh, an economic model moving forward based uh, securely in liberal democratic values you. Um, Derek, your, your last thoughts. Okay, we're way over time. And, and first of all, I'm really, really pleased my dog didn't bark. And I really, really pleased, Kenny, that uh, you gave us all this time. So thank you. Um, one thing we haven't even discussed is, is the pandemic. And we're coming out of a, I, mean, we, I guess Mike just talked about the vaccine diplomacy, but um, we have a term in, in, at NDI, build back democratically. We have build back better. We have to build back democratically because the pandemic is going to exacerbate some of the problems that and and the disparities of wealth and the divisions in society that were that preceded it, um, and we're going to have to get out in front of that. And it gets to what Dan talked about with young people, um, young people who are going to be very frustrated. Uh, we talked earlier about women. We've got to open the aperture. We've got to get democracy to be be more inclusive and get the old guys who are doing things the old ways, even with new rules, off uh, the scene and bring new blood and new voices. And we just need to remember well, there's more of us and there's more of, than of them. We, the, the people who want freedom, the people who are, who are demanding this, there's more of us. 
and we just need to hold together. It is an all hands moment. We need Taiwan, we need everyone in Europe, we need Japan, we need, we need to work together every technical capacity, every lesson learned, every piece of solidarity we need to be working and, and applying to this fight. And I don't need to say it in, in Asia because you have the Milk Tea Alliance, the Taiwan and Hong Kong and Thailand and, and, and Myanmar together putting up the three fingers in solidarity for freedom. Uh, that represents the future. We have to invest in that future, be patient, but work absolutely together in partnership and, and, um, and be mindful that it is a long-term effort, but that uh, in the end, uh, we are fighting the good fight. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Derek. Um, I think the fact that we are um, we exceeded our time limit means that there is still so much that we need to work on and there is that we need to discuss. Um, so um, thank you guys for um, staying up late um, and offering your very insightful opinions and recommendation to us and to the audience. Um, I know that in the future, we will have plenty more uh, opportunities and times um, so we could work together. And the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy is here um, to work with you and, uh, of course, with the local offices of NDI and IRI um, and Kathy from SIP. Um, and, of course, we welcome uh, more events with uh, Freedom House as we had last week. Um, and thank you, Carl, so much for um, your for being there for Taiwan and for TFD always. So thank you guys so much. Um, hopefully, we'll see you in person very soon. Thank you, Katie. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.